As we've discussed in our previous lectures, reading is a lot like driving. Both are quite complicated tasks and necessitate doing a considerable number of distinct tasks all at once. However, we've been reading and driving for so many years that our multitasking has reached a level we call automaticity. In fact, a certain degree of automaticity is absolutely essential for good driving and also for reading, but there are downsides as well. For example, most of us who have been driving for years have had a similar experience. We get on a familiar road to a familiar destination and our minds begin to wander. We arrive at that destination with the realization that we have absolutely no memory of driving to that place. We were truly on autopilot. Of course, we must have had some degree of environmental awareness in order to arrive safely at our destination, but it probably wasn't the safest drive. If you think about it, most of us have had a similar experience while reading. We turn the page in a book or scroll down on our phones and our minds begin to wander as we read. We finish reading that section and come to the realization that we have the foggiest idea about what we just read. We did read the words, but we did not understand them, nor remember any of the information or ideas. Has that ever happened to you? No, you're not the only one, I promise. In fact, some of us would remember reading the entire epic poem Beowulf in the very same manner when we were high school seniors. Now you may have noticed I used air quotes for the words reading and read because although we looked at the words we didn't really read them according to the definition of reading comprehension we've been using in these lectures. Reading comprehension is understanding and remembering what we read. Again please don't misunderstand me about automaticity. Multitasking in an effortless manner is certainly necessary for good reading comprehension. However, the Jedi Master is right. Both light and dark sides of the Force there are. The point is that good readers learn how to enhance the benefits of automaticity and eliminate or minimize the drawbacks. One important way to do so is through engaging the author-reader relationship. As in most of our lectures, I'll provide just enough background on an analysis of the relevant reading theories and research to help explain why the strategies you will learn will improve your reading comprehension. Perhaps more than any other of our lectures, learning a bit about the nature of the author-reader relationship and the roles of the author and reader will help you better understand and retain what you read. The launching point for our discussion is the 1938 publication of the book Literature as Exploration by Louise Rosenblatt. In this book, Dr. Rosenblatt develops the foundations of the reader response theory. In this and subsequent books, research, lectures, and articles, Dr. Rosenblatt explored what she termed the transaction which takes place between the author's text and the reader. Think of a transaction in terms of a business deal made between two parties, which results in a certain outcome. For reading, the transaction is the give and take between the author's words and the reader's input. The outcome of this transaction produces the meaning of the text. The key point to understand about reader response theory is that the meaning exists outside of the author's text and outside of the reader. For our purposes, meaning is another way of saying reading comprehension. In Dr. Rosenblatt's words, a novel or poem or play remains merely ink spots on paper until a reader transforms them into a set of meaningful symbols. The literary work exists in the live circuit set up between reader and text. The reader infuses intellectual and emotional meanings into the pattern of verbal symbols and those symbols channel his thoughts and feelings. Out of this complex process emerges a more or less organized imaginative experience. In subsequent writings, Dr. Rosenblatt refers to this specific literary work created by the author-reader relationship as the poem. So how exactly does the transaction between the author's text and you, the reader, create this poem? 
You grab your morning coffee and sit down at the kitchen table. You take out your phone and click on your favorite news app. Scrolling down to an article, which gets your attention, you open the article and start reading the text. All the input of the author, such as her research on the news story, her past experiences and biases, her on-the-scene interviews, the facts of the event, her writing style, and her word choice are combined into the text you read. The text acts as a stimulus to which you respond as a reader. Some of your reader response will undoubtedly be the same as other readers. For example, if you're reading an article on a school shooting, everyone reading that same story would feel sad, angry, and perhaps a bit helpless. Certain words in the text, such as tragedy or heroic, would evoke similar connotations. However, your individual reaction to the article will differ from that of other readers. Your personal associations, experiences, opinions, knowledge, and feelings certainly influence how you understand and react to the text. If you've read a few articles by the reporter and tend to disagree with her reporting or point of view, this will influence your personal reaction. Environmental factors may also affect your reader response. If you woke up grumpy or the coffee is cold, your response to the stimulus produced by the article may be different than if the sun is shining and you have the day off. If the reader response theory is accurate, the meaning that the author's text and your reading produces entirely depends upon the circumstances of the transaction. In fact, Dr. Rosenblatt claims that both the author's text and the reader are equally important and necessary in the production of meaning. In other words, the meaning of any novel, poem, song, article, or even this lecture is a co-creation of both what the author has to say and what the reader hears. So if the good doctor is right, I'm not the only one to blame if you haven't found this lecture to be scintillating so far. Now, Dr. Rosenblatt's position is in the mainstream of reading response theorists. While she stresses the important role of the reader in shaping the meaning of the text, particularly in terms of the reader's emotional response to the author's stimulus, she also values the role of the author's text. The text serves as a blueprint to guide and a checkpoint to restrain the reader's response so that the subjective experience of the reader is balanced with the objective text. Other reader response theorists have disagreed with Dr. Rosenblatt's balanced position and have de-emphasized the role of the author and text. Some have even trotted out George Berkeley's if a tree falls in the midst of the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound conundrum to question whether the author's text has any meaning whatsoever apart from that of its individual reader. According to these reader-centered theorists, the text only exists as it's being read in the mind of the reader, just as the tree makes no sound unless someone hears it. No right, no wrong interpretations, because there is no objective benchmark. So every student would get an A plus on any exam. Others have argued against the individual reader-centered position and claim that the social nature of reading has the impact on creation of meaning. Of course, we don't read in a vacuum solely of our own experience. As literary critics, we all have somewhat of a herd mentality. Think about how the interactive nature of social media creates meaning for better or worse. Now, some of you may be questioning whether the reader is really equally important to or more important than the author's words in determining meaning. A few of the buzzwords I just used to summarize Dr. Rosenblatt's theory may have stimulated your own critical response. Good, we're supposed to be partners in this transaction. You might think back to reading Act 2, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet in your freshman year of English. Is your interpretation of Romeo's but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, soliloquy of equal value in determining what the character means compared to what the author of the text, William Shakespeare, says and intends? I'm thinking you'd feel a bit uncomfortable 
in sharing your literary insights and interpretations if Will himself happened to be sitting in your English class. Doesn't Shakespeare's play remain objective despite your subjective interpretations? As a reaction to reader response theory, some critics have argued that the author's text should be read as is and in its own context apart from outside influences, such as the author's background, motives, and biases, and the reader's feelings, experiences, and interpretations. Many in this school of thought believe that the accurate meaning of the text may only be discovered if all subjective influences are ignored. These text-dependent theories especially rail against the more extreme views within the reader response camp. They would argue that a reader-centered transaction permits the reader to make the text say anything they want it to say. Far from the no-right-answer approach of some reading response theorists, they would argue that there are right and wrong interpretations of the author's text. After all, it is the author's text, not the reader's text. Teachers should ask, what does the text mean here? Not, what does the author mean here and why did she say this? And they certainly should not ask, how does this text relate to your own life and make you feel? According to these theorists, not everyone would get an A plus on their final exam on, say, Romeo and Juliet. Speaking of exams, let's place these author-reader schools of thought in the perspective of your own school experience. Were your English teachers and professors more influenced by reader response or text-dependent schools of thought? If you remember your English teachers and professors assigning plenty of independent reading and your assignments involved completing KWL charts in which you recorded what you already knew about the subject, wanted to know, and learned after reading, or dialectical journals, also known as double entry journals, in which you copied key passages from a text on the left side of a notebook in your personal reactions, textual analysis, inferences, references to other literary works, connections within the text, questions and summaries on the right side, then your teachers were using some reading response strategies. If you remember reading and writing about lots of class novels with line-by-line -line interpretations and literary analysis or close reading practice, an investigation of a small section of reading, using multiple readings and reader analysis of the text, including form, vocabulary, tone, and grammar, then you receive more text-dependent instruction. You probably were exposed to bits and pieces of both reading theories and practice over the years with different teachers and professors. Since the advent of the Common Core State Standards, text-dependent reading strategies have regained traction in schools and universities. But Dr. Rosenblatt's mainstream reading response theory remains influential as well. My take is that Louise Rosenblatt's reading response theory does ring true in describing the overall framework of text, reader, and meaning. Clearly, both the text and reader are partners in the transaction to co-create meaning. However, the relationship is not merely the print on the page interacting with an individual reader, nor is it a static 50-50 proposition. No text can be divorced from its author. Knowing the author's background, point of view, biases, and purposes for writing certainly influences the meaning of the text. Furthermore, readers can't help but contribute to the meaning of the text through their own feelings, values, experiences, and reading skill sets. Generally, the author's text should serve as the primary source of meaning and the stimulus to the reader's understanding and response. But the author-reader relationship is a dynamic partnership in which some texts are more centered on the author and some are more centered on the reader. Now let's put into practice what we've learned about the author-reader relationship to improve your reading comprehension with two practical strategies. The first strategy to help you better understand or retain what you read is monitoring meaning. Good readers learn to monitor meaning from text to text 
and within the text itself. With author-centered texts designed to inform, explain, and analyze, such as news articles, nonfiction, technical writing, legal text, and instruction manuals, the reader's comprehension should be primarily text-dependent. You, the reader, need to lean on the author and her text for meaning-making and less so on your own input. For example, when reading that news article on the school shooting, you would rely upon the expertise and accuracy of the news reporter to help you understand what happened. To put together a toy on Christmas Eve, you should depend upon the concise step-by-step -step directions as well as a good picture on the box. With reader-centered text designed to describe, entertain, or persuade, such as fiction, poems, editorials, social media posts, and songs, the reader's comprehension should derive from the mutual input of author and reader, depending upon the dictates of the text. When crucial facts or plot events are being delivered, you, the reader, should adjust to greater text dependence. When descriptive passages, emotionally based dialogue, and figurative language are used to evoke a certain mood, you need to shift to greater reader dependence. For example, if you are listening to and reading the lyrics of Lennon and McCartney's With a Little Help from My Friends, you as the audience are intended to contribute meaning to the song. Some of the lyrics are intentionally ambiguous. As the official Beatle biographer Hunter Davies explains, Lennon and McCartney struggled to come up with a lyric to answer their question, What do you see when you turn out the light? Lennon suggested, I can't tell you, but I know it's mine. It fit the required number of syllables and rhyme scheme, and McCartney loved it because it could mean different things to different people. The bottom line, is that good readers are flexible readers. They monitor and shift their sources of comprehension according to the genre of the text, the author's purpose, and within the reading itself. Skilled readers are active, not passive thinkers, who see the author-reader relationship as an interactive process. The second strategy to help you better understand and retain what you read is talking with the author. Talking with the author will give you the practical tools to implement the monitoring meaning strategy and will help you learn how to become an active, not passive reader. Have you ever noticed how your English teachers and professors insist on discussing a novel or an article and its author in the present tense? For example, when analyzing Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, your teacher might say, in chapter seven, Hemingway builds suspense in the conversation between Pilar and Robert Jordan. The two walk into the cave and discover that one packet of explosives is missing. And most of you remember that we also write a literary analysis in the present tense, unless you want a considerable amount of red ink written on your essay. Now, last I checked, Ernest Hemingway died in 1961 but we still discuss him and his writing as if he were alive because the author and his ideas remain relevant. Not only should we discuss authors and text as if they are alive, we should also read as if the author and the text are alive. It does take a bit of imagination, but if we treat the author and story as living, it's much easier to have a conversational rapport with the writer and characters within the story. You see, reading to a corpse would be a one-way conversation, unless zombies come into play. Reading with living, breathing authors and their characters can become an engaging two-way conversation. To demonstrate the difference, let's read a passage together from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities as passive readers. Since Dickens was, uh, or is, British, I'll try to read with an English accent. I know it's horrible, but it will serve a purpose. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. 
It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries, it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state, preserves of loaves and fishes, that things were in general settled forever. Now, let's read the same passage, and I will model how an active reader carries on a conversation with the author. I'll switch back to my normal West Coast American accent as the active reader. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Dickens clearly means to describe a universal theme with this general language. So often we tend to look back at some errors as the good old days, when they really weren't that good. Hindsight is never 2020 vision. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. I see Dickens' paradoxical patterns of the good to its bad opposite. But his extremes make me think that he's writing somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Nothing in life is that clear, especially when we're in the midst of experiencing it. His parallel structures of it was the use the absolute factual use of the to-be verb and the definite article the to describe a time of no gray areas. It was one way or the other. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. I know that some of the setting of this novel takes place during the French Revolution and that the two cities are Paris and London. My guess is that Dickens, an Englishman, is going to favor the ideals of his own London and disparage those of Paris. The traditions of the church were being challenged by the thinking of the Enlightenment, faith versus reason. Dickens unfairly places the Enlightenment thinkers in the evil position. I personally don't see faith and reason as a necessary paradox either. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. These polar opposites have everything to do with one's perspective. For some, the changes during this period of history were positive and the outlook was right. For others, the events challenged everything they had ever known to be true and good. I would wager that for a whole lot of people, what was taking place was a mixed bag of good and bad. Why doesn't Dickens include the haves and have-nots in his opening? If class differences are a key part of the historical setting, as in the musical Les Miserables, why did the author leave out these paired extremes? We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. Not sure what this means, unless Dickens is commenting on hope and despair. We are all going direct to heaven. We are all going direct the other way. I think this was meant to be humorous. Interesting how hell is an unmentionable, perhaps a curse word. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. The language is tough to dissect here. The period was so far like the present period that so far could mean that it closely resembled the time of Dickens' writing. The noisiest authorities might be the most popular voices of those times. This paragraph is all one long sentence. It seems that these contradictions of the past went on forever without resolution. What is Dickens up to here? Is he using this novel to criticize the present state of affairs in England?
There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a blind face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In other words, there wasn't much difference between rulers, perhaps due to intermarriage or more likely in their beliefs about the divine right to rule. Some things never seemed to change. In both countries, it was clear then crystal to the laws of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled forever. Hmm, let me reread that. It was clear then crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled forever. The loaves and fishes illusion of miraculously making something great out of very little, such as the expansion of citizens' freedoms and rights or democracy, were not realistic nor likely during those times. Is Dickens saying the same about his current times and knocking the English monarchy? If the reader response strategy, which I call talking with the author, worked as planned, you would notice that your understanding and retention of the reading passage were significantly better with the second reading as compared to the first reading. Notice that the window of meaning seemed to shift more toward the reader because of the universal themes and application to present times. You may have noticed that my comments in the conversation were of different types. I focused on what the author said and how the author said it. I also commented on what the author did not say and what the author may have meant. Additionally, I criticized and questioned. I repeated the author's words and reread in order to clarify. I speculated about the author's motive and where he was coming from. I also throw in my own two cents, as I might in a real one-on-one -on -one conversation. However, I tried to focus on the author's meaning and ideas, and not only on my personal experience. Now, the talking with the author strategy takes practice to perfect. You can use this strategy with every genre of reading. Practice doing so with texts and Facebook posts, emails, novels, articles, and technical documents. Of course, you noticed that I was making my comments out loud. My suggestion is to read the author's text silently, but to sub-vocalize your comments as you begin to use this talking with the author strategy. I describe sub-vocalization as using a six-inch voice to talk to the author. Don't worry, your author isn't hard of hearing. Some of you may have reservations about implementing this strategy. Interrupting the flow of your reading by talking to the author may seem stilted or unnatural. I certainly used more reader response in my example than I normally would to demonstrate the different types and breadth of comments. Not every sentence requires a comment. Instead of chunking the text into interrupted parts, you will begin to see a greater flow of ideas as you insert your comments. At first, you may find it difficult to keep up your share of the author-reader conversation. This new way of reading, in which you, the reader, have a role in the conversation, takes some getting used to. Make sure to develop a balance in the types of comments you make so that you aren't solely making comments, say, about word usage or the author's style. Using the talking with the author strategy will also temporarily slow down your reading. You may be tempted to use the strategy only with text, which isn't required reading. Resist this temptation and allot a bit more time for the sub-vocalizations for a while. If you practice reading the old way for some things and the new way for others, you'll never develop the automaticity that is necessary for effective reading response. I do want to assure you that your decreased reading speed will only be a temporary issue. As the reader response becomes second nature to you, you will naturally begin to replace the oral comments with silent ones. Gradually, the fully developed comments will become thought snippets. Much like millisecond dreams, these snippets can contain significant data. Our brains are simply amazing. I would like to close our lecture with a reminder 
of the no pain, no gain truism. Replacing old habits with new habits is always challenging, especially when you've been practicing the old habit for years. Yes, young and old alike, we all get set in our ways. However, be encouraged that you can teach an old dog new tricks. So develop the new habits of monitoring meaning and talking with the author. The rewards of better comprehension and more enjoyment of what you read will outweigh the discomfort of replacing an old habit with a new habit.